Welcome to another Adafruit wearables teardown. Today we're taking apart the Gotenna. It's a long range wireless radio for off the grid communication. It pairs with your phone over Bluetooth and then communicates with other Gotennas up to four miles away, depending on the environment you're in. It's great for things like music festivals where the cell network is oversaturated, um, wilderness communication for hiking, and it's also encrypted. To turn the Gotenna on, you just pull out the antenna that activates the device and then you can pair with it over Bluetooth. It has a fabric snap attachment point so you can attach it to your bag or your person while you're walking around. It communicates best with other Gotennas with no obstacles in the way and when there are buildings or trees or other obstacles it reduces the range. It allows you to send text messages, but also locations, and you can store offline maps. That way you can send your friend who's hiking with you your location and find each other while you're off the grid. It works with iOS and Android, and it's a pretty sophisticated device. Let's see what Lady Ada had to say about the design of the circuit inside. Thanks, Becky. So um, the Goat 10 is a really interesting radio device, and so looking forward to some really cool RF circuitry inside. So let's look at this circuit board. It's not too big, it's about two inches by maybe half an inch. There's a lot of labeling on here which makes this uh, very easy to uh, analyze. You can tell by the, lo by the logo that this is a Freescale processor. It's uh, exactly the MKL27Z128V MP4, which is a Cortex uh, M processor, I think it's an M4 processor, might be an M3 or M0. Over here there's uh, some Spanch and Flash. We've seen these in a couple wearables where they have to do a lot of data logging. Uh, so this is 8-pin uh, SPI Flash, probably you know about half a megabyte or so. And this is going to store uh, messages and data, maybe has calibration information. There's not, there's no EEPROM on a lot of Cortex M0s, so this would be a great place to stick data while you're buffering it. Over here, we see there is starting to be the, the RF analog section. There's a lot of components here, a lot of wire inductors that are used to match and filter the signal. So this processor is connected directly to this chip, which is a Scilabs SI4460 119 to 1050 megahertz radio, which is kind of neat. I mean, this is a very wide band radio. It goes all the way from 100 megahertz to up to about a gigahertz. From what I recall, the Gotenna is a, about 100 megahertz. Again, the lower the frequency, the farther you can go. Less data, I mean, it's, it, you won't be able to transmit voice as easily over data over 100 megahertz. But since it's only transmitting small sort of SMS-like data messages, 100 megahertz means you can just go that much further. So this is all the assistive circuitry for that. And then over here is a leather chip and it says RF10G. And while it, I couldn't find the exact data sheet for this part, it's, it's pretty clearly an amplifier chip. And the reason you can tell is because on the back, there's this heat sink gunk and this um, spread out ground plane. It's in a weird shape just because that's as big as it could get the ground plane. And it heat, heat sinks to the body. Um, and then you know, this amplifier is what's going to really give you that boost of signal when it does the transmission or it's, it's waiting to receive. On its own, maybe it would only give you, you know, maybe a couple meters of signal, but with this boost you can get up to a couple of kilometers. Definitely you can tell a lot of care and love was put into this analog section. And then um, over here is power filter circuitry, basically just getting everything for the amp, and then it connects to the antenna. Over here, we've got the LiPoly battery. You've got a kind of a classic LiPoly, 350 milliamp hours. Um, you want to get this as big as possible so you can supply a lot of current to the amplifier. Remember, like, it's going to take a big rush of current. Even if you have uh, capacitors to help you, you're still going to have like a big spike of power when you do a transmission. So the bigger the battery, it's not just for how long it lasts, but whether it can source that much current safely. You know, you can see there's this really nice big thick trace that goes right in, feeds into the amplifier. So right here is where you're going to get that power feed. And then of course it's going to also have a little trace on the back that, you know, goes over here and, and powers the microcontroller as well. This is the uh, SDW debug and programming pins for the main Cortex processor on the other side. This is the NRF8001. 
Uh, we even have a breakout for this in the store. It's a common Bluetooth 2.4 gigahertz transceiver. It's, it's ROM only. You don't program this chip. You basically send it commands over SPI and, and it sets up the Bluetooth connectivity for you. Very simple, there's a lot of good documentation. It's an older chip, it's really well known. So they do all the processing on the uh, Kinetis Freescale processor and just leave this to do just the Bluetooth stuff. Okay, we've got you know the radio, you've got all the analog sport circuitry, a lot of power path stuff going on here into the amplifier. Um, but where's the antenna? Where the path goes is out of this amplifier, through this uh, inductor over here, and then to this location, this is a little piece of glue, and this is a flex PCB antenna. Another interesting thing we noticed when taking apart this antenna, as you can see here, this little thing here, this is a um, rare earth magnet. And this is what indicates to the microcontroller that yes, it's been turned on, because when this is pulled open, this Hall effect sensor you know, no longer detects the magnet. You can connect it up to an interrupt pin on the uh, Freescale processor and just when you see it go off, that's when you turn on the LED, turn on the radio, and turn on the Bluetooth low energy. Cute design. For this and many other teardowns, we use these tools and the Adafruit USB microscope with its articulated stand. What wearables should we take apart next? Let us know in a comment below and check out our playlist to see all of our previous wearables teardowns. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to the Adafruit channel on YouTube.